about six o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started now. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Brady Newbill at the Museum of Discovery and Science, and welcome to our monthly Distinguished Speaker Series, sponsored by the Save Our Seas Foundation. Uh, tonight we have our special guest, uh, Catherine McDonald, Dr. Catherine McDonald, uh, the co-founder uh, and director of the Field School and lecturer of marine conservation biology at the University of Miami. Uh, Catherine has been doing work uh, in sustainable fisheries and ecology of uh, shark and ray populations in the Caribbean uh, and in the urban South Florida area. So this is going to be a very interesting and relevant talk uh, to a lot of our audience, uh, local here to the museum and to everybody else uh, watching from around the country and around the world. Uh, before we get started, just wanna go over a few rules and, and guidelines of how the program is gonna start. We're gonna be hearing from uh, Dr. McDonald in just a few minutes. And then we will be having uh, time for questions and answers after that. But at any time, uh, you can put questions in the chat. Uh, we're going to keep everybody's microphones muted just to keep any uh, interference and outside noise from getting in. Uh, you can turn your cameras on uh, as much as you're comfortable doing so. Um, but at any point in time, put your questions in the chat. We'll be collecting them and saving them for after the presentation. Uh, and during uh, you know the Q and A, uh, keep the questions coming. So at any point, something jumps out to you, uh, just put it in the chat before you forget. We'll come back around at the end and and, and have a good discussion. Uh, but first, uh, just want to thank the Save Our Seas Foundation for making this possible, and thank our special guests for joining us tonight. And so, uh, with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Catherine McDonald, uh, who I'm going to make sure is unmuted now and. Uh, so Catherine, uh, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you guys so much for having me. So um, today I have planned to talk to you mainly about my Save Our Seas funded research in the Southeastern Caribbean. So if you're dying to hear about urban South Florida sharks, let Brady know and I'll come back. Um, but today we're mostly gonna be talking about shark fisheries in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So let me throw this up here for us. And hopefully folks can see that. Looks good. Perfect. So my name is Dr. Catherine McDonald. Um, I'm a lecturer at the University of Miami's Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science, uh, where I teach marine conservation biology and head up the Master of Professional Science in Marine Conservation. And I'm the director of Field School and a co-founder uh, which is a organization that uh, trains students to do safe marine field work with a variety of organisms, including coastal sharks. Um, so just a very tiny bit about me. Those are my two full-time jobs, so I stay pretty busy. Um, and I have 14 years of shark research and field experience. So I've been working on sharks for a pretty long time uh, since I won a 2007-2008 Thomas J. Watson Fellowship uh, right after I graduated from college. So if you have questions about the shark world and shark research more generally, uh, at the end, I'm very excited to talk about that stuff too. Um, if you have heard of me before, which most of you probably haven't, um, it may be because I uh, mouth off on the internet about the difficulties that women in particular face in shark science. So if that's something that you're curious about, I'm also happy to talk about that at the end. But let's start with a, a brief overview of shark fisheries and shark fisheries issues before we get into the specifics of my research in the Eastern Caribbean. So uh, shark fisheries are actually pretty valuable, even though sharks are typically considered to be a relatively low value fish outside of the value of their fins. Uh, shark fisheries globally are worth about a billion dollars a year and 439 million of that uh, is from the sale and trade in their fins, and 380 million of that is from the sale of their meat. We'll talk a little bit more about this next slide, but the kind of public conversations that we have about shark conservation often focus really heavily on the trade in shark fins as the driver of shark conservation failures and, and threats to sharks. Uh, but as we can see from that valuation, uh, meat plays a big role in demand for sharks as well. And many fins that wind up in the global fin trade uh, come from sharks that have been eaten by subsistence fishermen before their 
uh, fins are sold into the fin trade as a way of generating um, revenue. Many, many species of shark have shown stock biomass declines. And this is particularly true for sharks in places where fisheries management uh, and enforcement is limited or non-existent, uh, which almost always includes the deep sea, often includes poor nations who don't have a lot of money to devote to fisheries management or enforcement, um, and includes fewer of the kind of relatively wealthy and powerful nations like the United States. Even as we do have threatened and endangered sharks in our waters, uh, overall, the conservation status of sharks in US waters is improving and has been improving uh, in recent years as the result of our ability to fairly effectively manage them. Um, but you all have probably heard at least some broad sense that sharks are declining globally and that is and remains unfortunately accurate. Global catch of sharks peaked in 2003. And uh, you know when we see those peaks, sometimes it means that their price fell, demand for them fell, and so fishing effort decreased. So you see a decline in catch. Um, but this peak we think is likely uh, not a change in fishing effort, but a change in shark availability, as many previously relatively uh, common and abundant populations have shown declines. Globally, shark fisheries are continued, uh, considered undermanaged, even as there are specific examples of sharks being managed effectively at both a national and international level. And one thing that I always wanna talk to people about because I don't think it's explained that well a lot of the time, is that at least in the United States and through us in a lot of other places, the goal of fisheries management is something called maximum sustainable yield. So uh, often advocates will come to me and say, but like, I don't think anybody should fish for sharks. I don't think anybody should eat sharks. I don't think anybody should kill sharks. I don't have any argument with people who take that moral position. I, I understand, I mean, I don't think there's a lot of folks who think sharks are cooler than I think they are, but the goal of our fisheries management is to take as many sharks or fish as possible without compromising their future availability. So we're actually failing in our management objectives. If we are taking fewer sharks out of the population, then that population can sustainably tolerate the loss of. Uh, the goal is to maintain future availability while also extracting the greatest volume of fish possible. Um, and often we don't realize that, that that's actually the goal of management. And it's more difficult to do for sharks than a lot of other species. We'll talk a little bit about why in a minute. I also always wanna to touch at least briefly on shark finning um, because it's by far the threat to sharks that gets the most media. And shark finning in it, its simplest terms is cutting off the fins of a shark and discarding the rest of the body at sea. So a shark can be caught by fishermen, can be harvested, can be used without being finned. Right, an animal that is landed with its fins naturally attached, um, which is a, a technical term, but it just means you don't take the fins off before it's brought back to land, um, has not been finned, even if its fins subsequently end up in the fin trade. So when people talk about banning finning and what they mean is banning all shark fishing, finning means something different than fishing for sharks. Uh, and we also wanna distinguish between finning, that process of cutting off the fins at sea, and the fin trade, which is kind of the global exchange of all shark fins on the market, both from finning and from legal uh, shark fisheries. Uh, you may also sometimes get petitions encouraging you to um, argue in favor of banning shark finning in the United States. Shark finning has been illegal in the United States for about 20 years, so you don't need to sign those petitions. Um, and the question of whether we should be banning trade in fins is one I see both sides of, and that's pretty complicated, um, in part because it's a bit of a waste, right? If the animal has been legally landed uh, for meat and the fins are there and available, uh, it kind of bums me out to throw them away. And I feel that it penalizes the fishers who are trying to follow the rules. But um, this is a bit more of a South Florida issue than a St. Vincent issue because uh, shark finning has been illegal in St. Vincent since 2019 and was banned there preemptively 
uh, there was no market for shark fins. All of the fishers that I speak to told me that they either threw the fins of their sharks away or they used them in lobster traps as bait. Um, so the international fin trade really doesn't play any role in the fisheries that we're about to talk about. The last thing that I wanna flag for you, particularly around finning, is that the discourse about shark finning can often become quite racist and classist. Um, even from well-respected ocean NGOs, you'll occasionally see uh, them putting out messaging that I find really troublesome, either describing shark finning as barbaric, uh, which is obviously a really loaded term to apply to mostly poor fishers from the global south, um, or talking about uh, Asian consumers of shark fin soup, particularly from China, as the problem for shark conservation, which also often can is a very simplistic way to talk about this. Uh, I try to make sure to remind my students always that uh, in 2016, the US was the seventh largest global exporter of shark fins in the world. Um, and so to uh, point an accusing finger at subsistence shark fishers, uh, to point an accusing finger at consumers who are not attentive to the environmental consequences of their actions when that could describe plenty of Americans uh, is also fundamentally a bit of a problem to do. So I do encourage you to be on the lookout for that in the discourse and to challenge it where you see it. So why are sharks vulnerable to overfishing? Why do we see their populations declining? Well, part of it, I'm trying to illustrate here with this, which is called an Eltonian pyramid. And the key idea of this Eltonian pyramid is that as you move up in trophic levels, each of those steps up is a different trophic level, which just means um, it eats the thing below it, uh, you lose energy. So at every trophic level, only 10 to 15% of energy is retained. So if plants produce 10,000 unit of energy, when they're then consumed by zooplankton, uh, it takes 10,000 unit of energy of the plants to create 1,000 unit of zooplankton to create, and then it takes that thousand units of zooplankton to create a hundred units of fish, a hundred units of mesopredatory fish to create 10 units of higher mesopredator fish, and then all of that, all the way up that pyramid to create our apex predator. So this is gonna help explain to us both why sharks are less common than a lot of other things, right? If you if you have the same number of sharks as plankton, the shape of your pyramid would kind of look like this and your sharks would obviously starve. You need that large base to support your sharks at the top. And actually for some apex predatory sharks that are migratory, one of the reasons they migrate is to distribute that top of the pyramid weight across multiple ecosystems so that they're not placing all of the demand uh, energetically in one place. Uh, I mean, obviously they're not thinking about it that way, but they're going where the food is. Um, so we can see that as energy moves up, you need a strong, healthy base at the bottom to create a pretty small tip at the top. Um, that means that the biomass of sharks can't get too big, right? Or it'll, everything will be out of balance. And so it makes sense that they would evolve reproductive strategies that don't allow their populations to increase rapidly. But that means that if you overfish them, they will often struggle to recover from that overfishing because often they kind of take a long time to mature, they have long gestation periods, uh, and they give birth to relatively few offspring. Um, here's one of our mesopredators here in South Florida. That's a little black nose shark. Um, people often ask me if they're babies, but that's a full grown male. Thank you very much. He's offended by your question. Um, and that's their adult size. Uh, there are more than 500 species of shark and the average length is less than a meter. So uh, about three and a half, a little bit less than three and a half feet uh, for an adult shark. So the things that we think about when we think about shark week, um, hammerheads, bull sharks, tiger sharks, great whites, um, these are actually the outliers when we talk about sharks uh, and these, medium-sized mesopredatory sharks are far more common uh, among shark species. 
So this vulnerability uh, is because they're mostly what ecologists call K-selected. And K-selected is just a fancy way of saying that list we see there in blue, right? They have large bodies, size, late age at maturity. It takes a long time to grow that big. They produce fewer offspring that are more developed. They're investing more in each individual offspring. Uh, and that leads to high juvenile survivorship, right? So their strategy is to have just a couple of pups and count on those pups surviving and thriving and going on to reproduce. Whereas teleost fish, which is our fancy ecology word for bony fish, tend to be more what we call R selected, which is the opposite, right? A relatively small body size maturing quickly, uh, producing lots and lots and lots of offspring, usually by spawning, releasing those uh, gametes into the water. Um, we're investing very little in each individual offspring on the assumption that most of them won't survive to maturity, but we're putting out so many that at least a couple will. Uh, and we have that low juvenile survivorship rate. So teleos can recover much more quickly from overfishing than K-selected species can, right? Uh, if you overfish a teleos and then you reduce the, the amount of catch allowed the next year, uh, they're able to rapidly replenish that depleted population. Uh, sharks really struggle to do that. And for many species, rebuilding times are very long. Um, we have some species here in South Florida that are not expected to be rebuilt until after 2100, even without any fishing pressure. The, the dusky shark in particular uh, is one that we know it will take a very long time to fully rebuild. So one of the challenges that sharks face is the contamination with environmental toxins through a process called biomagnification. And we're back to that Altonian pyramid. We remember a limited amount of energy is conserved at each level. So if our little plankton at the bottom each take up five units of mercury, and then each of our zooplankton eat five of those plankton, um, they each concentrate 25 units in their bodies. And then we see how that moves up the chain, right? As you move up trophic levels, levels of contamination go up very quickly. Um, and so apex predators are the most likely to be contaminated, which is why if you've ever seen um, mercury warnings on tuna, that's the reason for it. Uh, most tuna are mesopredatory fish, few are apex predatory fish, but as they get bigger and bigger, um, they're more likely to have high levels of contamination. Mercury in particular, um, but other toxins as well, are what are called fat soluble. So they get stored in uh, the animal's fats. Uh, they're easy to absorb, but they're very difficult to excrete. Normal waste elimination won't do it. So they build up in tissues over time. And the problem, one of the problems with that is even if you tried to burn the fat that they're stored in, right, you'd consume the energy inside that fat cell, maybe the mercury would be released into your bloodstream. But then as soon as you restored fat, it would go right back into your cell. It's, it's very hard to get rid of except through processes that actually rid the body of fat. Um, male animals don't really have those. Uh, female animals can do that through reproduction. Uh, and through lactation. Uh, sharks don't lactate, um, but some dolphins we know uh, are dumping toxins into milk uh, that's being given to their calves. Uh, and we know that we've seen some reproductive failures in long-lived apex predatory marine species as a result of mercury contamination. The biggest thing I'm concerned about with mercury contamination in St. Vincent is the potential for it to pose a human health risk to people who are reliant on shark to meet their nutritional needs. So briefly, we'll talk about St. Vincent itself. It's a small island nation in the Eastern Caribbean with a population of a little bit more than 100,000 people, about 27,000 of whom live in Kingstown, uh, which is right here. Um, although its population uh, has increased a bit um, since this map was drawn. If you are attentive to the news, you may have noticed in April that they had a major volcanic eruption. 
Uh, so if you enjoy the talk and you want to do me a personal favor, um, there are a bunch of places fundraising for really for St. Vincent. Uh, and we'd be very grateful. We're fortunate that our collaborators have all stayed safe, um, but it's certainly been a difficult time for the nation as a whole. Um, St. Vincent has a public debt burden, burden that's about 74% of their GDP, 20% unemployment, and 48% of its citizens are poor or vulnerable to falling into poverty, and 5% are undernourished. Uh, the 5% statistic in particular is a really impressive one because the government of St. Vincent has managed to bring that down from about 15% in just over a decade. Um, so it is a, a very admirably scrappy country um, that has faced a lot of economic challenges in recent years. Uh, its primary industries are agriculture, especially of bananas and service and tourism although it does not command the same premium uh, in tourism as many other Caribbean countries do. It's primarily a destination for yachters who want to island hop uh, more than for people kind of flying into the country for vacation, at least so far. Uh, the other thing that we need to know is that there's a strong geographic importance of the windward versus the leeward coast. Uh, so the windward coast of St. Vincent, uh, which on, this map is the right side, um, faces a lot of wind and waves from the Atlantic. Uh, the leeward coast uh, does not face those same pressures and so is a much safer and more comfortable place to operate a boat or to fish. Um, here we have the topographic map and we can see that volcanic crater up here, uh, La Soufre. So this is a picture from a hike up La Soufrere. This is more or less what the country looks like. It's extremely rugged. Uh, there is, it's very mountainous. Uh, it's very, it makes movement very difficult. There's really one primary road that runs around the external edge of the island, um, but very few internal roads or internal development because it is so mountainous. Most of the towns uh, look just like this one, kind of existing in in a, a pocket uh, around a bay. Um, this is the capital city, Kingstown, which looks a lot like other Caribbean capitals. Um, and uh, an agricultural field, we can see how rugged that terrain is. Certainly, if you had a flat spot to farm, you wouldn't choose to farm quite so vertically. Uh, so St. Vincent is fortunate in that it has a pretty high average rainfall. La Soufrere is quite tall. Uh, it helps generate uh, rainfall and good conditions for uh, many forms of agriculture, um, but also for the most part, it is very steep and challenging to operate in. So our research goals for this project were to assess the potential human health risks associated with shark consumption, uh, to understand the current fishing practices and their conservation implications that were occurring there, and to try to integrate some biological and some social data about shark fisheries there. Um, so in an early survey that kind of kicked off this study, 53% of adult respondents in the country reported that they ate shark, at least sometimes. Um, I was there as part of a study team that was looking at consumption of whales and dolphins. Uh, St. Vincent has IWC International Whaling Commission permits to hunt four humpbacks a year. And so my collaborators were looking at um, the risks associated with eating humpback and pilot whale and whether those might be introducing really dangerous contaminants. Uh, and in the first day of surveys, because I can't help myself, of course, I was asking questions about sharks. And after that, we added the question formally because a lot of people said, oh yeah, sure, I eat shark, it's great. Um, and discovered that this was an unanticipated and previously overlooked mercury exposure risk for this population. This is further complicated by the fact that mercury risk is affected by how food is prepared uh, and frying in particular, and 76% of our respondents said that they ate it fried or it was best fried, um, forms a crust which prevents uh, mercury from migrating out of tissue as it's being cooked. Um, and kind of traps it inside, increasing the 
likelihood that the full contamination of the meat itself is going to be consumed by people eating it. So Vincentians wound up eating shark partially because it's an abundant large marine animal in their waters and people have to eat. Um, but also partly through the influence of Trinidadian cuisine. Uh, so if you go to university and you're from St. Vincent, most students go to the University of the West Indies uh, in Trinidad. And UWE, as it's called, uh, is a great place for people to be introduced to Trinidad's national dish, bacon shark. Um, and so many well-educated Vincentians return home after university uh, with an affection for and an interest in continuing to eat um, bacon shark that has created a market and demand for fried shark uh, in St. Vincent that perhaps didn't exist before. Uh, I heard from older folks that for most of them, uh, they grew up eating shark kind of curried or boiled uh, when a fisherman in their town caught it. And, you know, it was cheap and available and, you know, everybody would get a piece to take home. Uh, these days, it's more of a specialty food, uh, more of a special occasion food and something that people actually, you know, would want to eat rather than a food of last resort. Uh, in a lot of places, including St. Vincent historically, it was an, a considered a relatively undesirable food that was uh, sort of protein of last resort for the poor. Uh, that shift in perception uh, has definitely driven more demand. Um, it's also relevant that technological improvements have allowed for freezing and refrigerating it more effectively. Uh, anybody who's worked with a shark, even a living shark, can tell you they don't smell amazing. Um, if you leave one out in the sun for any length of time, you're not going to want to eat it. Uh, as part of their management of their internal salts, uh, most sharks have high concentrations of urea in their tissues and they pretty much smell like urine. Um, and so unless shark is very fresh and well refrigerated, uh, it's not appealing to eat. Uh, so improvements in access to refrigeration and freezing have definitely also probably helped make it a more palatable food. Um, Fisheries management and enforcement in a place like St. Vincent can be quite challenging. It's 32 islands. Um, they have one fisheries research officer for the entire country responsible for all species that are captured in commercial fisheries. So uh, keeping track of everything that's being caught, managing it appropriately is uh, an incredibly difficult challenge. Uh, and you probably won't be terribly surprised to hear that uh, depending on the fisher, uh, relationships between fishers and managers vary a lot. Uh, and obviously with 32 distinct islands um, and many, many different landing points for seafood, enforcement is a difficult challenge. So this study is working with local collaborators to collect mussel and fin at markets and at landing sites. Um, is conducting mercury testing of the muscle tissue that's actually being consumed, is working closely with fishers to collect data on their fishing effort, the gear that they use, the species that they target, and the sites that they fish. And we're interviewing restaurant owners and shark meat vendors to try to better understand existing commercial markets for sharks. And the picture that you see here on the right is the primary fish market in the capital city, Kingstown. So one of the first things that we found out through our ethnographic research is where is fishing happening? And we found that it's mostly on the leeward coast uh, of the main island of St. Vincent. Um, and that makes sense and it comports with fishing effort in general, right? The leeward coast is friendlier uh, to fishing in terms of weather and wind. Sharks are taken there primarily as bycatch in fisheries that are targeting pelagic species, particularly tuna. There's a very deep channel that runs between St. Vincent and the most northern of the Grenadines, Beckway. And um, that deep channel allows a lot of pelagic species to pass between those two islands. Uh, and pelagic just means open ocean. Uh, so folks who are going out for tuna 
uh, that's often then being sold to the tourist market in Jamaica, um, will occasionally catch pelagic sharks that they're not necessarily looking for. Um, and some of them will release them because they don't wanna deal with them. And some smaller proportion will retain them and sell them for meat. Uh, size is a significant factor shaping retention. There were a lot more people willing to retain a small shark than a large one uh, because we're mostly talking about fishing off quite small boats and trying to handle a large shark off quite a small boat is a dangerous proposition, especially if you don't have a lot of experience doing so. Um, and so those choices definitely shape consumption patterns. Uh, we also know that North Windward, which has a strong fishing tradition, um, is culturally distinct uh, in terms of fishing effort, in part because they do not have the same easy access to the fish market at Kingstown. So if you catch a large shark and you live in a small town, you may not be able to sell it before it goes bad to the people who live around you. If you live on the leeward side and you catch a large shark, you can run down to Kingstown in your boat. It's not a terribly long trip uh, and sell it at the main fish market uh, much more easily than if you live in North Windward. In Beckway, which is the largest of the Grenadines and the one closest to the mainland that we can see there, the primary fishing community is a town called Paget Farm. Uh, and Paget Farm is a historical fishing and whaling community. But sharks there are caught mostly as unintended bycatch uh, in net fisheries targeting smaller fish. Uh, talking to pretty much everybody in town, we found that there's one part time shark fisher who targets nurse sharks. Uh, and that's the extent of intentional targeted shark fishing uh, for the entire island. That said, nurse shark is commonly eaten there and is typically available at the two restaurants in Paget Farm. And then uh, we also talked to folks in Union Island, which is the southernmost grenadine that belongs to St. Vincent. Um, and faces quite different challenges than St. Vincent, right? St. Vincent is relatively fertile, if steep, uh, has a lot of rain. Uh, Beckway gets a bit less rain, but they have easy ferry access to St. Vincent. It, it takes about half an hour to get between them. Um, that southernmost grenadine, it takes quite a lot longer to get to. There's not nearly as much trade with the, what Vincentians call the mainland. Um, and there's a lot less rain. It's a water poor and relatively arid area uh, that's fairly agriculturally unproductive compared to St. Vincent. Uh, they have also lost access to local coral reefs for fishing um, through the creation of the Tobago Keys Marine Park. Um, so that area I think relies more on shark for food security than almost any other. And the animals being targeted there are quite different from the pelagics we saw off the coast of St. Vincent. Uh, we see them targeting mostly shallow water, more reef associated species like Caribbean reef sharks or black tips. Uh, so across um, the three islands that we concentrated our uh, conversations with fishers on, we found a wide variety of gear is in use, including hand lines, lures, uh, nets, fish traps, uh, and at least one person who dives down and uh, ties a rope around a nurse shark's tail and then drags it behind the boat to bring it in. Uh, they pretty much all use relatively small open air outboard motor boats like the one that you see in the picture there. Um, that's a Trinidadian pirogue. So that's one of the larger uh, fishing boats available uh, in St. Vincent. And then there are smaller locally built boats uh, as well. Obviously the question of fishing rights is a bit complicated. Um, St. Vincent uh, shares a water boundary with St. Lucia to the north and Granada to the south and St. Lucian and Granadan fishermen uh, often cross that boundary. Vincentian fishermen often cross those boundaries too. Um, and so there's a sense of uh, occasional conflict around fishing rights. Um, this is the largest uh, fishing vessel I've seen in operation in Vincentian waters. Uh, it was Vincentian flagged, but local fishers told us that it was a Trinidadian vessel. Uh, 
I wasn't able to confirm that. So one of our early challenges that was a lot of fun was working with our fishers to try to translate local names for sharks to uh, science names for sharks. And some of them were pretty easy, sun shark, sand shark. Uh, that's what we would call a nurse shark here in Florida. Uh, horn sharks, we did some of this and uh, horn sharks are definitely hammerheads, although I think that we probably can't break that data down into great versus scalloped. Um, white sharks are definitely not great whites. Um, because when we talked about how big they are, uh, we were told that white sharks are, uh, which is definitely not a great white shark. So we think that they are probably mostly Caribbean sharp nose, um, maybe some black noses. Tiger sharks are tiger sharks everywhere. Those stripes are pretty iconic, um, but we're not sure what a lemon shark a king or a king kingfish shark are um, yet. We're working on it. Uh, Obviously we do have lemon sharks here in South Florida, but I don't wanna make the assumption that because we call it that here, that's what it is there. Um, sword tail shark, we were also able to sort out. Um, it's a thresher shark. If you describe a shark to me that you say has a tail as long again as its body, there's really only one genus that that shark could belong to. Um, and bank sharks and blue sharks, and we still don't know for sure what those are either. The genetic testing of some of these samples is gonna be really exciting. Our fisher collaborators often send us pictures of their catch and tell us what it's called. Um, but by the time things make it to market, usually they're selling only the trunk of the shark, the fins, the head have all been cut off. And there are a lot of species of shark that it's pretty difficult to identify from just that trunk. Uh, Vendors tell us that shark sells good, but it isn't always available. It usually goes quick, and that's true. If we wanna see what shark is in the market, you wanna get there soon after it opens. Um, one of the joys of working with people is that their answers almost never agree. So we had one vendor tell us that shark is the most popular fish in St. Vincent right now. And another vendor tell us that shark isn't very popular. So no definitive answers, um, but I can tell you that it sells out pretty quickly. So I tend to agree with the guy who told us that it's popular. Uh, it's also not terribly expensive. It's five to $6 Eastern Caribbean uh, that fishers are paid for their shark. And it costs about $7 Eastern Caribbean to consumers. And uh, as of right now, that conversion rate is about 270 EC to the US dollar. So we're talking about really just a few dollars a pound. Um, we also see a difference in local versus urban markets. Um, fishers probably sell it for a bit less in their home communities uh, than they are getting paid for it when they bring it to urban markets. But that makes sense because they're using time and boat fuel uh, to actually bring it to Kingstown to sell. Um, we also talked to people during that survey about their decisions about shark consumption and found some religious objectors. Um, there's a um, passage in Leviticus that calls for not eating fish without scales. And uh, at least the Seventh-day Adventist church in St. Vincent considers sharks to fall uh, under that remit. And so there's a considerable portion of the population that won't eat them because they consider it religiously inappropriate. Uh, there's some folks who won't eat it because they think it's gross. Um, this one man told us that he used to eat shark, but when he saw how sharks live, he stopped eating it because they'll eat anything. They'll eat dogs, they'll eat anything that's put in the sea. Uh, and so it's a bit unclean to eat them. And we had several people tell us that it's only fair to eat sharks um, and that they'll only eat the kinds of sharks that will eat people. Uh, and it's a way of evening the score. So why is it worth trying to understand subsistence shark fisheries in the Southern Caribbean? Is a reasonable question and one that I've been asked, right? Why should we spend money talking to fishers in a small, relatively poor island nation? Um, why is this even worth doing? And I think the answer is in part that it illustrates the challenge of conserving species uh, in the real world, right? It's one thing to say that you care about sharks and you wanna see their populations thrive. 
And it's another to say that you don't care about people who rely on sharks for their livelihoods. Um, and so I always want my students to be thinking about those complex and really often quite difficult trade-offs. Um, because in the absence of that kind of consideration, we end up with this sort of form of conservation cruelty where we ask people who have very little to bear the costs of conserving something because we care about it. Um, I also think that it really illustrates the extent to which our common management tools like maximum sustainable yield are not useful everywhere. We've tried really hard to export that model of, of research and science-based management. Um, but the truth is that there, there are no government resources here for closely tracking catches. There are no government resources here for um, assessing shark populations on an annual or even every five years basis. And so management tools have to be more flexible, uh, something that requires St. Vincent to carry that sort of uh, bureaucratic and managerial weight is not realistic. Um, and finally, that these fisheries really don't fit neatly into popular global narratives about shark exploitation. Finning isn't the problem here. People aren't getting rich off of sharks. People aren't monsters who don't care about the ocean. Um, it's not large, faceless, cruel, industrial um, fishing conglomerates, you know, pillaging. Uh, it's people going out in the morning to try to feed their families. Um, and so I think that at the end of the day, my personal belief is that conservation that doesn't work for people is conservation that will not work long term. Right. You know, you can go down there and you can stop fishers from going out. But as soon as you leave, they'll be back on the water. The goal needs to be to find ways to manage resources that respect local people's right to make a living right to make their own decisions about their resources and give them opportunities to thrive. If we, as kind of American uh, citizens or scientists, decide what other people should do with their sharks, I think that's fundamentally quite a problematic approach to take. And so that's why I think it matters. Um, I can't talk about this without acknowledging my amazing local collaborators, particularly Jeffrey Alex and Vincent Reed. Um, my collaborators on that survey work, uh, Dr. Russell Fielding, uh, other co-authors, and the students from Suwannee uh, who helped actually carry out the survey, which was a tremendous amount of manpower. My colleagues at Field School who have helped me in a variety of ways with this work, particularly Nick Perney. Um, and the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Department of Fisheries. And of course, I need to acknowledge the Save Our Seas Foundation, who are the major funders of this work through a Keystone Grant. Um, I've got some key references here that I'm happy to share with anybody who's interested, but if not, I am delighted to take your questions. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you for that. We can, um, I think you, we can stop sharing screen now and we can, um... Uh, so that was uh, fantastic, very enlightening um, look into what marine conservation really looks like. And I'm glad that um, uh, you shared a lot of great angles that people might not think of because here in the United States, uh, it's easy enough to say like, oh, we'll just stop fishing for sharks. Isn't that <laughs> simple enough? But if, uh, you know, there's other places in the world uh, will have other traditions, other diets, other uh, resources that are available to them that mean something uh, totally different. And um, that's always something different to keep in and other ways of operating. And so uh, one thing I'd like to kind of ask about just in your experience with working with communities down there and also um, governments down there. And you mentioned that there is one office uh, patrolling the waters of 32 islands and you know, so what do you, how much can you really enforce uh, with that? And what is a, you know, what, what's the general kind of attitude towards um, the regulations and uh, fishing laws and, and, and what's kind of already in place? Is it, uh, you know, is it generally legal to fish for sharks at a, to a certain extent? Is it, um, you know, what, what are the regulations really like and, and 
you know, how, to, how does that tend to look on a day-to-day -day basis down there? I would say that in general, fishers are concerned about the health of the marine environment. Uh, there is no one who wants to wipe everything out. Um, but there's finite available resources. Um, so I didn't see, and, and we don't see a ton of big sharks being landed. We don't see really any targeting of sharks other than nurse sharks. Um, but there's also pretty limited management in place. Like I said, they banned shark finning in 2019. Uh, I think that there are concerns about sustainability, but there's just, they've had to make some tough decisions about what to prioritize. And I think that um, the hope is that the ban on finning will prevent any sort of real commercial market for this outside of meat uh, from developing. And that in the absence of that market, as long as we're talking about animals primarily being caught as bycatch, the likelihood of major conservation harm is pretty low. Yeah. Uh, uh yeah, because it seems like a, a, the type of fishing that's happening down there with sharks is not maybe the kind of horror stories we've seen in other documentaries and so forth. It's like there's a big industrial monstrous machine. It's a more community based uh, practice, uh, which is going to be inherently less uh, problematic on a global scale. But um, so, so it's, it's interesting to think about uh, what sustainable fishing means in, in different areas and in different ways. Uh, so uh, this is. And I'd say I've never worked with any fishermen anywhere in the world who don't have some beef with managers. Um, but that relationship is, I think, pretty functional mm -hmm. uh, compared to a lot of other places, in, in part because it's, it's easier where it's a small enough country that people know each other personal relationships exist. There's right. less, you know, it's less a faceless bureaucracy um, than in a lot of other places. Yeah, and so the smaller the operation, the different that dynamics is going to be than, than say with like an industrial fishing off of our coast or uh, in, in Europe or uh, off the coast of Japan or something like that is going to be different. So that's, you know, again, really interesting to think about. We have some questions coming in from the chat I want to get to. Uh, uh, Harry is asking, um, considering the ways that mercury and other contaminant, contaminants get into the sea, uh, what are some advice and tips about human interaction about avoiding that kind of thing? We were talking about uh, biomagnification and uh, what are some things to look out for? Uh, you know, for us, if we're shopping around for seafood, uh, what should we look out for to avoid that kind of uh, risk? So to avoid mercury risk in general, you wanna eat those lower trophic level species, right? So the lower on the food chain something is, the lower its levels of mercury contamination as a general rule. Um, it's uh, with some exceptions, you know, if you think about potential contaminants building up in sediments, some bottom dwellers might, that are low trophic level might have slightly higher levels, but in general, lower on the food chain is better, uh, you know, Sardines, anchovies are always uh, a really environmentally responsible choice. Um, and that has the added benefit of usually being a more sustainable fishery too. Yeah, that's a good, I know there was, uh, I've heard uh, definitely risk, uh, one fish that's brought, been brought up of risk is giant groupers uh, accumulating uh, toxins and things like that. I actually uh, remember hearing some work about that being done at UM years ago, but. Uh, studying cigaterra and things like that but yeah so i think yeah generally any any high trophic level mm -hmm. species is going to be at greater risk yeah very much uh joyce is asking uh how is the volcano the volcanic eruption that just happened in saint vincent affecting the sea life in that area and sharks i mean honestly i have no idea um but my impression is that uh, it probably led to a temporary decline in fishing effort as people weren't really able to be out or were involved in kind of evacuation and rescue efforts rather than out fishing. Um, and that there may have been some increase since then as uh, a lot of land-based sources of nutrition are less available having been 
buried in some cases under a foot of ash. Um, so I would guess that it's it's probably in total a bit of a wash, um, but at some points I think it probably reduced fishing efforts and at others it probably increased it. In terms of what the sharks themselves make of the volcano, uh, I'm not sure, uh, but I can say that we see um, sharks off South Florida respond to events like storms or um, changes in atmospheric pressure or changes in water temperature by moving away from conditions that they don't like. So I would expect that if the eruption was having a meaningful effect uh, on coastal waters, we would have seen some species at least moving away uh, in an effort to avoid that. Yeah, that would make sense just swimming further away as sharks, I think, could cover some cover some territory. Um, uh, Shirley, hopefully I'm saying that right, Shirley is asking, uh, are there any attempts in the area to introduce aquaculture to supplement the source of protein uh, in order to conserve things like sharks? There has been some, I don't, I hesitate to say like movement on that. There's been discussion about it. Uh, as far as I know, it hasn't yet made it beyond the discussion phase, but it wouldn't surprise me if at some point it does. Uh, obviously, aquaculture comes with its own set of environmental impacts, uh, but the the presence of that deep channel just offshore that, uh, you know, would carry wastes away from the pens and, you know, the water there is, is quite deep, so it's not going to have a really localized effect in the way that some shallow water pens are, um, but also when you've got a deep channel with moving water, uh, trying to make those pens stay put becomes a different challenge too. That's a great point and something that I kind of want to uh, touch on for a second, just uh, regarding um, some of the differences uh, geographically uh, between what we might be familiar with with this part of the world, which is off our coast here in South Florida and in the Caribbean islands is, well, first of all, we were just talking about a volcano erupting. There's also a gigantic trench uh, along that area where water depth and the relationship of the continental shelf is totally different. So uh, the makeup of those waters is going to be a lot different than, uh, than where we are in Florida and other parts of Florida where aquaculture is a lot bigger, like in the Gulf Coast, uh, radically different uh, shorelines and uh, makeup of the, of the ocean floor there. So uh, just to kind of clarify that that's gonna be a lot different too. I mean, and St. Vincent also depends pretty heavily on food imports, um, particularly of chicken, but also of some seafood. So um, typically they're a net exporter of um, large fish that are kind of consumed whole or in fillets, mostly by tourists elsewhere in the Caribbean. Uh, so catches of uh, things like tuna or grouper are likely to be exported. Um, and then they tend to uh, eat more of the smaller fish or the kind of less attractive to tourists fish. Mm -hmm. uh, Harry actually had a follow up to his uh, question about um, avoiding contaminants in the water is, uh, wouldn't it be also better to avoid um, eating uh, any animals higher up on the food chain because that would uh, help conservation in that entire population because of what we were talking about with growth rates of sharks being a lot slower than uh, say herring or something like that that can reproduce a lot faster. Is that uh, something else to think about? Yes, absolutely. It's both, uh going to show lower levels of all kinds of environmental contaminants and it's going to be more sustainable overall because, you know, the fewer trophic levels, right, the less energy is being lost before it reaches you. Interesting, yeah. Um, just out of curiosity, remind, uh, from your experience of working uh, in this area of, of research, of doing sustainable fishing research in an area like St. Vincent and the Grenadines in the Eastern Caribbean, uh, what is kind of in the reaction that you get in like going up and asking those questions, uh, you know, do you eat shark or do you eat fish shark? Uh, what's the kind of uh, reaction and uh, how have you been received in uh, introducing these kind of topics into that area? Unsurprisingly, um, 
there's some people everywhere who don't want to be bothered by you, which I think is fair enough. Um, but I would say overall, the people of St. Vincent have been incredibly friendly and welcoming and kind to both me and the variety of research collaborators that I've worked with there. When we had college age students out conducting these surveys, um, people were both a bit touched to learn that we wanted to understand more about what Vincentians eat. Um, and every single day, my students were coming home with fruit from somebody's garden with, uh, you know, a story about how someone insisted that they try a bite of what whatever they had on the stove. Um, so it's it's been a very welcoming place to do research for which I'm extremely grateful. Um, but a big part of that is uh, having great local collaborators, which I'm fortunate to do, um, who really help facilitate working thoughtfully within a community and not coming in with, you know, I think it's pretty common for scientists to come in with this attitude of like, well, I'm the expert, so I'm gonna tell you what you're gonna do about this. And that is absolutely not how I would approach it in part because I am not an expert on Vincentian sharks in anything like the way that somebody who's been fishing for 25 years is. Um, and in part because the thing that I'm interested in is finding ways to ensure the sustainability of this, this fishery while doing whatever I can to make people's lives better. So I see my role there really as um, advisory. I'm happy to learn what I can, I'm happy to share what I've learned, um, but it's not my job to tell anybody what Fishers or the Vincentian government should do uh, from a regulatory perspective. That's a decision for them to make about um, the right way to allocate those resources. Yeah, I think that's a great approach and it seems like you uh, have a great way of, of doing that and including the community and collaborating with uh, what everybody already knows down there, you know, and uh, just as if you would be looking up uh, papers that have already been published on the topic, you have to kind of work with what's already there. Um, and so it seems like you, you have a great approach to collaborating with the community. Uh, so we're just about out of time here. We're very grateful for you doing that work and coming to talk to us about it because this is the type of topic that we don't hear a lot about or uh, read a lot about or, or know a lot about. We uh, like to talk about, you know, marine biology as just kind of a universally global thing, but it uh, works different and it, 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 at different places have a different relationship to it. And um, I think it's really interesting that you're uh, you focused on that topic. And thank you for joining us and, and sharing all that with us tonight. Thank you so much for having me and thank you all for your patience with a, a slightly different kind of talk today. Absolutely. Well, thank you again uh, for everybody else. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you to the Save Our Seas Foundation for making this possible. Stay tuned for uh, some upcoming great events. Uh, we have a great roster left for the rest of the year. Next uh, one of these talks is going to be July 1st at 6 p.m. We'll be talking to Dr. Katie Lyons, research scientist at the Georgia Aquarium. Definitely come to that. She's amazing. Sharks and we'll probably be hearing a bit more about biomagnification and uh, some of the other things touched on tonight. So we're excited about that. And then a lot of great speakers down the way. If you're in the area, uh, we are open down here seven days a week. Uh, so come on, check us out. We have some great events coming up. Uh, Saturday, we're unveiling the new Dino Dana movie as well as uh, June 26th, another big event, our family pride day. Uh, so come out to that. Uh, grateful to have that back this year. Um, and a lot of, uh, and stay tuned for the rest of our Save Our Seas Distinguished Speaker Series, uh, getting together the first Thursday of the month at six o'clock here on Zoom. Stay tuned for the links, go to the website for our roster and hope to see you further at those. Uh, so thank you again for joining us. Thank you to our guests, Dr. Catherine McDonald for joining us. I'm Brady Newbill at the Museum of Discovery and Science, signing off. Thank you again to the Save Our Seas Foundation for making this possible. Thank you so much, Brady. Thank you.